have, um, I'm Sue Austin, for those of you who don't know me, I think I, I, think I know almost everybody here. <laughs> Mindy Staples, your guy's secretary, who needs a round of applause. Poor Mindy, I've been dragging her on this little road show around the district, so she's been getting her public speaking skills um, tested a little bit. So today, I have a brief presentation for you about the McKinney-Vento Act, and the McKinney-Vento Act is about homeless education in um, the United States. So it's a federal law, and I just want to go over it with you quickly, and uh, then I'm going to ask Mindy to sort of give you a little bit of the info about the resources that we have at the high school, which is pretty unique. And then I'm going to let you fly be free unless you have some questions. I do have people that want to be out of here by 3 o'clock. I will definitely plan on doing that. So if you guys can, uh, you don't have to shout out your answers. You can hold on to them close to the vest for a minute. So what is the McKinney-Vento Act anyways? Federal Act reauthorized by NCLB, NCLB under Title 10. I'll read it to you for those of you who are like me and can't read anymore from a distance. A law protecting the educational rights of students regardless of their living situations. Harder to remember and pronounce than the term Title 10, which is the other option for you. Or all of the above. Hold on. How many U.S. citizens are one paycheck away from being unable to pay their rent or mortgage? I could ask that same question in this room, right? Um, one in ten. One in five. Or three in five. Hold on to that. And by law, schools can't use Title I dollars. Title I is money that we receive from the federal government to support reading and math and some other pieces for associate, low socioeconomic students or those who are struggling. Um, so we, by law, can't pay for A, clothing for school, one month's rent, dental and medical needs, or graduation gowns. So think about that one for a second. We're going to go right through and I'm going to answer these questions for you. Let's see how many of you got them right. So what is the McKinney-Vento Act? Homeless Education Act. That This was one of the, the easy ones. How many U.S. citizens are one paycheck away from being unable to pay their rent? What do you guys think? One in ten, one in five, three in five? Three five. Seven. Yeah, how many in this room? You know, that's, we're all there. If you haven't planned well, you're there. Okay. That says a lot. By law, schools can't use Title I Part A dollars to pay for. What did you think? There was rent, medical, um, graduation gowns, clothing. What do you think? No. Okay, let's see. It's rent. So if we have a student who's homeless and can't is, is a graduating senior, we can take care of their cap and gown for them, that kind of thing. And we can support with clothing if we can do that. The, the deal is this, Title I funds need to be set aside, and we only set aside about $2,000 towards homeless education support in that Title I funding. The rest of it goes to support um, K through five, pretty much elementary reading and, rec and math. So I do use my Title I fun funds to help fund Cindy, I mean Mindy's position because it helps us a ton in terms of monitoring everything. What we can't pay for, interestingly, is transportation under most circumstances. So just quickly, some of the statistics in Maine right now, and this was as recent as I could get, was through 2011. Um, it's dropped, you know, our median income has dropped by 7.7% 7 .7 from 47,000 to 46,000. None of this is probably news to you all, understand, you know, you're living with the pain itself. Um, in, unemployed people has increased by 43% and folks living in poverty by 15%, which puts this number in 2011, 49,000 of our main kids are living in poverty. We know that number is higher today based on the economy that we're living in. But still, it's fairly, you know, it's, it's a big increase over from 2007. The data in Maine, this is the reported data. We know, particularly at the high school level, there are many, many more students who are living in a situation of doubling up moving around so that they're not necessarily considered to have a full-time residence, but it's not reported. So this is the information from 2010-11, 1,625 kids homeless. When we were at a conference a couple of months ago, 
Bindi and I were, you know, talking with the folks throughout the, the state, and they think this is probably a quarter, really. It's so it's that underreported. But where are those folks living? In shelters, which um, we don't have a lot of shelters in our York County area, but we do have a few. There's a couple in Sanford. Um, there's the Alfred Shelter as well. Doubled up is the primary, so you know students already that are couch surfing. Hotels and motels, those are mostly and primarily the folks that are living in coastal, where there's a lot of um, availability of motels and hotels in the winter, for winter rentals. Unsheltered, probably more so in the larger cities, you know, in, in terms of that. And there's, there's just that error of percentage that nobody's really sure what that stands for. But in our case, doubled up is probably the biggie. So is homeless the right word for it? Well, this is how it's defined. And I gave you guys just a quick little fact sheet about the McKinney-Vento. So it's students lacking a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. How many of you know a student who's living in that right now? Yeah. There's a lot. It's, you know, half, half of you in here can say, I know one of the students that are, that are struggling. So hotels, trailers, campsites, we actually have in Lebanon um, Sky High Campground, which accepts students on a short, or families on a short-term basis to live there, and they're living in camping situations with very little, um, you know, running water not always, electricity not always, just depends on what they're able to set up with. Um, so utilizing their facilities rather, and they stay there for a good part of a school year. And then the students sharing housing are doubled up for, for economic reasons. Oops. Uh, oh well, we're just going to keep going. <laughs> Facts on students in transition. None of this, is, again, is things you don't know. 20% of children and youth without a stable housing do not attend school. So this is where we're battling, trying to keep our kids in school. And this is what the McKinney-Vento Act is really all about. Within a year, 41% of these students will attend two schools, and then another 28% will attend three or more schools. And think about what happens with every transition. Each change in school, it hits their, you know, set, set back academically four to six months. And again, you know, you, you know these kids that are in your classrooms and are moving from school to school. What are our responsibilities? We have to appoint a district liaison, which is what I have been doing for a number of years. And we need to do community outreach, which we're trying to do. We try to hit, you know, reach all the shelters and we reach all of the, the churches and the you know, food pantries, etc. We need to do more of that, and we're working on that. We do provide free or reduced lunch for those families that will seek it, and that's a, that's a problem, because not everybody's willing to come forward and say that they need the help. So, it's an important piece of it. And we need to enroll students immediately. This is something that's difficult for us, particularly since we have a sort of transient population in terms of between state lines. Summer's worth to hear. Um, We've had phone calls from, from, from guidance and said, you know, what do we do about this? This person is claiming that they're homeless. We have questions about residency. We say enroll, and we'll deal with the rest of it later. But it is one of those things. It's our required by law. If a person comes in and claims that they're homeless, we need to enroll that student immediately with, without documents, which is counterintuitive to us, because we always want to make sure that our tax money is paying for our kids here in our district. But it doesn't happen so much that we should um, feel like we need to fight that too much. And providing transportation to a student's school of origin. School of origin is where that child has become homeless. So if I have a student who has lost their rent and their parents need to move to a shelter in Sanford, we are the school of origin. Therefore, we are required, if the parent chooses, for their child to continue to be here in SAD 60 to, to provide transportation. The good news is we split that with Sanford. Sanford will go back and forth with us, but that child will be transported back here. That's something that, that sometimes people struggle with. I've had students in Barrington, and we've transported for an entire year, because there is no length of time on how long you can consider, you can consider somebody homeless. If they are in transitional housing, it's considered still a homeless situation. So we, we struggle with that. That particular family had a, 
uh, several levels of children in terms of little elementary kiddo in the first grade through a high school junior or senior. We transported that senior here for that year. The elementary child, I worked with the family to have them, encourage them to enroll in Barrington because it was so much closer. Because a 40 minute drive one way for a little kiddo is tough. And if the family, but if that family had said no, we want, we're coming back to Lebanon, we want that to continue. If she had fought me on it, then we would have continued that transportation. So it really is a case by case basis. So, and again, use, title, use funding if you set aside enough from Title I to assist the qualifying students. But that, again, it doesn't cover transportation. So what we ask of you, in terms of your, our teaching staff and our, and our you know, folks that are here, is become familiar, which is what I just shared with you, and it's, it's, very, it's pretty, pretty baseline. Um, monitor student comments. A big piece of it, you guys hear it, you know it. People in the health center, I'm looking at Cindy, I'm sure she's hearing it on a regular basis. You know where kids are when they're not in housing that's really um, stable for them. If you get that information, pass it on. Either you can call Mindy, you can call me, you can let Joe know, or any of your administrators, because we'll follow up and check in with them. If parents refuse to refuse the services, that's okay, but we should ask. That's the key. Um, again, you know, changes in student behavior, clothing, etc., and share that information with us. So what we need to do is these kind of things. We're, we're going to start doing this on an annual basis, um, and we'll be able to just make sure that everybody is aware of the, of the McKinney Vento Act. Um, we coordinate with outside resources. I know that Mindy's been talking with you know, some of the area churches. I work with the shelters so that I know what's going on and who's, who's, who from our district is where. Um, and we'll post more outreach materials in the community. And we act as advocates for those kids. That's, that's our job, to make sure that those kids get what they need in order to maintain a steady school um, career. Sometimes it works. <laughs> Sometimes it's a struggle. So that's my portion of it. We're doing well with the time. I'm going to ask Mindy to come up and just um, share with you what's happening here at the high school because there's a lot going on that you may or may not know about. Up here. Um, I just would like for all of you to um, be able to take away from our talk today just that um, first and foremost, um, as far as the reporting goes for homeless students, sometimes um, when we see students or families that are doubling up, living with other families, either friends or other family members, we might consider that a stable enough environment um, for them. But when in fact we do really need to know about that, um, it can still cause stresses within um, the child's daily, um, just basic, um, what, they, what they do during the day. So, um, and that can change at any point. Um, so if you do know about that, there are, um, I mean, we do try to report that and, um, you know, I try to let Sue know that, but I think that that's probably one of the biggest things is that we do have a lot of families that are living together in the district. Um, also, as far as the high school goes, um, it's very important for you to remember that uh, it doesn't matter um, how the student got into that situation. Um, we all know that students in the high school um, sometimes have pretty good tempers, and so um, we know that the situation at home um, might not be the best. Um, they may just have gotten into a simple fight with their parents and, and left. Um, and our, the parents might say, well, I didn't kick them out. They can come back whenever they want, but um, in terms of that, we need to remember that it doesn't matter how they got into that situation. They're in that situation, and we need to just help guide them through that and uh, try to make um, school a stability for them. Um, and last but not least is the resource closet that we've started here at the high school. Um, I thank you all for your donations. Um, that's been great, and we do service a lot of children out of that closet. Um, right now, we're just taking the personal items. Um, but I would like everyone to know that it is a district-wide um, availability for everyone. So if you know a family that could use some sort of care package, um, please, let, please let us know. And um, 
if you know of a family, even if they're younger children or whatever, if someone needs a coat, boots, anything, um, if you know that a kid really wants to do track and they need sneakers or um, you know anything like that, um, please let either Sue or I know and, and we'll make that happen. Um, I have many contacts within the community. Um, Pratt & Whitney has been a great resource for us, as well as um, some of the local churches. Um, the New Covenant Church in North Berwick has a food pantry, as well as a clothing closet. And the Methodist Church in Berwick also has a clothes closet there as well. So um, there are many places that we can you know, get stuff for kids if need be. And I think that's it. Do they have questions about this? I'm looking at my time. 2.53. <coughs> go ahead. No, I don't want to cut off questions, so go ahead. Sorry. Um, what if he wanted to make donations, like, um, in terms of clothing or anything like that? Is there any program like that set we're, up? We're working on it. And the, the reality of it is, is we don't have it. The biggest um, stumbling block to taking in clothing donations is, well, there's two things. One is what gets donated and how clean it is when it gets there. But also, space. So I'm looking at Joe going, come on Joe, find me some more space. <laughs> like we have more space here at the high school, right? Um, but we'll, we, if you have something that you want to donate, just let us know and we'll figure out where, where the best place is to put that. If it's, you know, if you've got young kids and you have clothing that you want to donate for a smaller fry, I already put the word out to my um, elementary principals to be thinking about how they can create their own closets and their own own space in their own buildings. So we're definitely interested in helping. And we also have some volunteers who are ready to hit the road and, and gather things for us. So we can put them on that as well. So yeah. Any other questions? All right. So just, you know, pay attention to the conversations that kids are having and send them our way, okay? Thank you.